All right, well, we're going to start off the webinar and um, David DeLima, our, our South Australian State Director, is ready to go and would like to open up in prayer uh, as we enter into the discussion for the, on, on euthanasia, the no case for euthanasia in New South Wales and, of course, Queensland. Thank you, David DeLima. Thank you, Greg. Let's pray as we begin our webinar. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have today to learn from these three excellent speakers so be with Kevin and John and Alex as they share with us. And Lord, we come to you with uh, hearts of great concern for the most vulnerable in our societies. And we lament the way in which so many jurisdictions seem to be embracing euthanasia now. We do pray for New South Wales, for its parliament especially, that it would have the courage to resist the tide and certainly not legislate for euthanasia simply on the basis that everyone else is doing it. And Lord, we do pray for your wisdom to be upon the parliamentarians, Kevin Connolly and others there especially, as they consider this question, give them your wisdom, give them your eloquence and ability to persuade their colleagues so that the vulnerable in our society will be protected and that we will not go down this pathway in New South Wales. So be with us as we learn better the arguments that all of us need to be putting forward to our authorities and that we may pray more earnestly so be with us in this webinar, we ask now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, David. I hope everybody can um, see our program for today. I uh, just want to make sure that I can introduce our speakers for today. And Kevin Connolly, MP from New South Wales Parliament. Alex Schattenberg, Executive Director, Euthanasia Prevention Coalition based in Canada. And Professor John Whitehall, Christian Medical and Dental Fellowship. Uh, of Australia. They will be our speakers very shortly. Can I just quickly make a comment that uh, that both David and I are your host. We will be taking questions and we ask you to post them as the presenters have their uh, uh, speaking uh, segments. So please email us or, or, or via the um, uh, webinar program. What I'd like to do is just very quickly to put it in mood. Um, these are some of the headlines that are appearing in Australia at the moment uh, that I've picked up over the, over the year or so. Standards of end of life care continue to decline in Australia. Australian states to legalise euthanasia. There are um, only two of our states in Australia are still yet to enter into the euthanasia legislation, New South Wales and Queensland being the two states. Also, of course, former AMA doctors, Australian Medical Association, have spoken out, rejected euthanasia legislation. So we've got a, a really good um, range of people that are prepared to speak out and say that euthanasia, euthanasia, voluntary assisted dying, is not the right way to be going. So what I'd like to do now is just mention that we have an organisation called Coalition for Life which is made up of about 20 organisations. And um, we've come together to fight the New South Wales legislation. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased that it's uh, headed up by the Sydney Catholics. And I think that's um, an excellent initiative and uh, a lot of the organisations are on board. For those that don't know, Alex Greenwich is the independent MP. He introduced his vol voluntary assisted dying bill in 2021, which was on Monday. And hopefully, hopefully we can prevent that going any further. He will table his bill on Thursday, 12th of August, with a view to it being debated in September. Likewise, um, the bill, as you can see, is there. Likewise, in Queensland, the voluntary assisted dying bill in Queensland was introduced on the 25th of May, 2021. So there's a lot happening. And what I'd like to do now is, if I may, is to introduce Kevin Connolly, New South Wales State MP, who's going to give us a quick overview of the political aspects of how this is all going to work out. Kevin, over to you, and thank you very much for coming on board um, for the Family Voice webinar. Over to you, Kevin. Thanks, Greg, and good morning to you and to everybody else, and good evening to Alex in Canada. The context, as you've described, is, is fairly challenging for us. Uh, throughout Australia, over recent years, most states have um, had this legislation foisted on them. 
and it seems, it seems, as I say, unstoppable. Uh, I'm not confident about the situation in Queensland, but I know less about that. But I do know that in New South Wales, we are going to confront this head on. We have a bill, as you've said, that's called voluntary assisted dying. Now, of course, that's the euphemistic term. It is a bill to allow assisted suicide and the killing of a person by another party. That's what the bill permits. You can either administer a dose of a lethal substance yourself, having had assistance to do that, or you can have somebody else administer it to you. That is another person kill you. This bill therefore is bluntly, it's a bill about killing people. It's a bill about death that promotes death over life and says that for some people in some situations, death is preferable to life. Now that's a proposition which I reject. That's a proposition which I think the community, if you put it in those terms, would be most uncomfortable with. It's therefore a bill based on a rotten foundation. And however they, people try to dress it up, and they will, and they are giving it nice sounding terms, and they're certainly stressing, oh, it's voluntary. It's only letting people do what they want with their lives. It's still a bill built on a rotten foundation, and it doesn't just affect those people. And I'll get to that in a moment. But I liken the, therefore, the bill with these so-called uh, protections and Alex Greenwich is actually running around saying it's the most conservative form of bill that's come up in, in Australia. There's nothing conservative about it at all. The fig leaf protections that it have are nothing more than lipstick on a pig. You can beautify the, the pig, but it's still a pig. And that's what this bill is. And the protections are actually pretty cheap lipstick at that. They're not very good ones. So I, I guess later in the, the session, we might get to some detailed questions about that. Mm. But fundamentally, I taken the time over the last day and a half since the bill was circulated to read it. And it's not different, it's not better, it's not any more appealing than the other bills around Australia that went through. Two things I'd say before I hand over to, to the other speakers, I guess. One is, because it's a bill about death, this utterly destroys the doctor-patient relationship. You don't go to doctors to be killed. And this will undermine that really important relationship of trust that a health professional should have with a patient, that you should be able to rely on your doctor, on the nurse, on the hospital, to look out for your best interests and your welfare to protect you. The moment that people start to fear going to health professionals, that is totally undone. And I know that some people will quite rationally decide that if the state supports the idea of killing people in some circumstances, then I might have to think twice before going to that doctor or before going to that hospital, because I might not come back out the other side. And that is a terrible initiative, a terrible place to put people that they might fear going to healthcare. The other thing is to say that once we normalize suicide, once we say that's just another option like any other option, it's an ordinary thing to choose. What are we saying to other sectors of society where we have problems of mental health, of depression and of suicide? Suicide is not something which is only affecting that person. We all know the tragedy, particularly of, of young people who suicide, the ripple effect that has to so many, the harm that does to, to the whole fabric of the, the society that person belongs to. To pretend that normalizing suicide has no other consequences is a grave mistake. These are significant issues raised by these bills, which their proponents simply gloss over. As I started out, I'm saying it's a bad bill built on a rotten foundation. And no matter how much lipstick you put on it, it's still a pig. Thank you, Kevin. I think you've made a very good point there. I mean, the, the fact is that the bill introduced by Alex Greenwich is, um, is, as you said, is not any different from what you see around the rest of Australia. Uh, everybody should also be aware that uh, this is happening in Queensland as well. I know that Kevin Greenwich did make some concessions and we'll come to those later in terms of exemptions, but we'll have a talk about that later, Kevin, when we go into the QA. But I, I think they're just sort of red herrings personally, but uh, let, let's get into the debate later. I'd like to introduce Alex Haddenberg from Canada. Alex, I'm so delighted you, you've joined us. I know that you're a uh, um, Youth in Asia Prevention Coalition, and you're doing some wonderful work. I'd like to hand over to you and uh, Alex, take us through 
from your perspective on why we should be making sure that we oppose any euthanasia VAD bill here in Australia, New South Wales and Queensland? Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, basically, I'm going to go through a little bit of stuff about Canada. There was a question that came up that I'd like to answer right off the bat before I even get started. And that was the question of one of the best ways to fight these issues is, first of all, be focused on the issue of euthanasia, assisted suicide. Be focused on the bill itself. Don't get into other issues. Don't mix your issues. Don't talk about other issues. Focus on that alone. Why are you focusing on that alone? Well, because uh, you're going to obviously wanting to uh, focus on why this is a bad idea, but when you fix it with mix it with other issues, suddenly then it becomes about other issues also. And we can't do that uh, because people have different political leanings and different positions on different things. So you're trying to find people who are gonna say, I don't like this bill. Secondly, call it what it is. Be very straightforward and call it what it is. The other side uses euphemisms to make them feel better. I'm going to go a little bit through what's going on in Canada because I think a very strong, powerful example of what happens when you legalize is what happens in Canada. We've only had it in place for five years in Canada. So I'm going to go through this very quickly. And I'm going to explain to you that uh, the fact of it is, is that uh, many people, they view, they view euthanasia and assisted suicide within this whole paradigm of suicide and it's a negative act, but this is, and they say, this is like a personal act. It's my body, my choice. This is what they're saying to you, right? It's my decision. It's my life. But in fact, uh, when we justify euthanasia and assisted suicide, th and they're saying this is about people who are dying anyway. But you see, this is not true. This is not about people who are dying anyway. And this is not a personal act. This is an act of somebody else being directly involved with causing the death of somebody. Canada legalized euthanasia in June of 2016. So it's just a little over five years ago. Um, so we oppose euthanasia, why? Well, first of all, it's an act of killing. The killing's done by lethal injection. So if it's assisted suicide, it's an act of providing lethal drugs to cause death. So in fact, both of them are an act by another person directly involved with causing death. This is not, uh, an issue of my body, my choices is being sold to people. This is an issue of how somebody else is involved with killing somebody. That's what it's about. In Canada, when we legalized euthanasia, what did we do? We created an exception in the criminal code to homicide. So if you want to find our euthanasia act, you look in our homicide act and you see that there's an exception to homicide. That was about the only real honest thing about the whole law. It's creating an exception to homicide, but at least it's telling you what it is. It's homicide, okay? And what does the law actually do? It gives in Canada, so it'd be a little different in each state depending on how they word it. It gives physicians and in Canada also nurse practitioners the right in the law to kill you, to cause your death. That's what it actually does. They say it's about my freedom, my choice, my autonomy. But when you read the laws, they actually are about physicians having the right or nurse practitioners and physicians having the right to cause your death. That's what the law is about. So we, we uh, legalized this in 2016. You know, the original law that we legalized in Canada had a, a part of the bill and it said, we had to do a review in five years. So our review was supposed to start in June of, 26, of 2020. Instead, the government expanded the law before they ever did a review. So now they've expanded the law. They, they passed this Bill C-7. And so they've expanded it to include several things, including mental illness, euthanasia for mental illness alone. And now they're doing the review after they expanded the law. So it shows you when you legalize something, you've already crossed the line. The line is... Are we going to kill people or not kill people? That's the line. Once you've legalized it, you've crossed that line. So now the only question is, when will we amend it? And right now, that's what we've been doing. We've been amending it. Uh, they said that Bill C-7 in Canada is based on a Truchon, the Truchon court decision in Quebec. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but the fact of it is, is that that was not true. Uh, I'm not going to get into all that. Recent Health Canada report came out showing that there were 7,595 reported assisted deaths in Canada in 2020. Now you say, that's a big number, Alex, but what's the greater point? 34% increase from 2019. We're only into this for a few years, right? We're, we're only into this for a few years and we've already got to this point. And we represented 2.5% of all deaths. And in the product, province of British Columbia, it represented 4% of all deaths. And we're only a few years in. This is the point. It's growing very, very fast. It's been accepted very, very fast. And my data shows that we're, we've, we're well past the 25,000 death mark already. Um, and you would say, yes, but how do we compare those numbers to Australia? Well, you could do the math. The point of it is, is it's become accepted very, very fast, okay? It's been moving very, very fast. So euthanasia for mental illness is one of the things that were legalized in this recent amendment. So you're thinking the original law didn't allow euthanasia for mental illness. You had to be competent. And now they're saying, oh, 
well, we're going to allow euthanasia for mental illness. But what the government said is, well, we're going to hold on to that for a couple of years because we haven't des designed yet the protocols for killing people with euthanasia for mental illness. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that happens very, very fast. And you would say, well, we're not going to do that in Australia. Well, let's think about that. If it's all about suffering, do not people with mental illness also suffer? Why wouldn't you do it? They're also suffering. If it's all about suffering, why would you wait for someone to be terminally ill? Isn't that a discrimination? That's what was argued. That's exactly what was accepted. So uh, Dr. Sun Yugain, and he's a, a, um, a very well-known psychiatrist who was the former head of the Ontario Psychiatric Association. He tested to the government. He testified to the government saying, it's impossible to predict whether mental illness conditions are irremediable. Now, why is that word important? Because the law says you have to be irremediable in Canada. And he says, you can't predict that. The government didn't care that one of their key uh, witnesses was saying, you can't say that because it's not possible. They extended it to mental illness anyway. Uh, Dr. John Mayer, now this is a physician in, in Ontario who deals only with very hard cases of psychiatric cases. He deals very difficult cases. And so he said that when uh, the government extended euthanasia to people with mental illness, he had a patient who was in her 30s who decided to refuse treatment because why? She wants to die by maid, medical aid and dying. That's what she wants. So she decided to refuse treatment. Now, has this all been all fine and good and well? Well, not for Candace Lewis, it wasn't. In August of 2016, Candace Lewis, who was born with multiple disabilities. Now, remember, that's only two months after it was legalized in Canada. Now, Candace Lewis was pressured by her doctor to ask for an assisted death. Candace was very sick. She was receiving treatment. The doctor asked her mother if she knew that assisted death was legalized, and her mother said no. The doctor said that he supported assisted death, and he wanted to help her. The doctor was told that they weren't interested in assisted death. Uh, the doctor told her mother she was selfish and then challenged Candace by saying, do you know how sick you are? What happened is Sheila, Candace's mother, took Candace home because she was being told Candace was dying. Candace was very sick. Candace was dying. So she took Candace home to die at home. Uh, Candace didn't die. Now, I'm not saying all people don't die when they're near to death type thing. What I'm saying is in this case, she didn't die. OK, she got better. Roger Foley, who lives with cerebral ataxia, he had to launch a lawsuit in August of 2018 because the, off the, the hospital was offering him euthanasia rather than saying, we will help you get assisted living. They were saying to him because he needed, uh, he needed self-directed care, which is a program in Ontario, and he was turned down for self-directed care even though he needs 24-hour care. He's, he's, his disability is to the point where he can't actually do anything for himself anymore. He was turned down for self-directed care, so he was at the hospital. He says, I refuse to leave until the province approves me for self-directed care. Uh, and the hospital said, well, you can pay $1,500 a day or you could die by euthanasia. Those are the choices he was given. This is a very recent story. Joan Rowaway from British Columbia, very recent story. Uh, she was, uh, uh, she had cancer. She had, she recently just passed away. Uh, she was talking to her oncologist about treatment options and the oncologist said, there are no further treatment options, but there is made medical aid and dying. So uh, after the discussion, uh, the doctor, the oncologist decided that Joan had somehow asked for maid. Okay. So the family says, Joan does not believe in euthanasia. And she was partially sedated at the time of the conversation. That's what the family said. So when asked by the BC Health Authority representatives, so what happened is these BC Health Authority representatives went to Joan's family where she was living and being cared for as she's dying. And they said that if you don't allow her to have her euthanasia, we will remove her from your home. We will legally take your rights away. We will remove you from your home mm -hmm. to make sure she has her euthanasia. This is the kind of thing that happened. You may say, oh, that won't happen in Australia. Remember, if it becomes medical treatment, then how can you be denied your medical treatment just because your family's caring for you? You see, this is the kind of thing that comes into play. Uh, in August 2020, Isabel McKenzie, a British Columbia seniors advocate, reported that some nursing home residents had requested an assisted death based on social isolation due to the COVID pandemic. In November 2020, there was an article in our major, one of our major newspapers about Nancy Russell. Now, this was actually promoting euthanasia, this article. But Nancy Russell was not dying, but she had requested to die because she wanted to avoid another COVID-19 lockdown and she was approved for euthanasia. She died by euthanasia. The story referred to Russell as a social and spry person who suffered during the first lockdown. She had other health related issues, but she was not, she did not have a terminal condition. Now she was in her, uh, she was in her nineties. 
So she was older. She had multiple com comorbidities, but she was not dying. And if you think that you're not going to have this forced on you, well, in British Columbia, now British Columbia is more extreme than the rest of Canada, so you'll have to know that. But, you know, maybe your state will become more extreme, too. The B.C. government defunded the Delta Hospice Society, which ran a 10-bed hospice. Why? Because they refused to kill their patients. The B.C. Health Authority said, the B.C. Health Ministry said that because you're receiving government money, you must then allow euthanasia. And the Delta Hospice Society, we said... We will not allow euthanasia on our premises. We won't do it. So they defunded them. Then when they defunded them on February 24th, they expropriated their 10 bed hospice. Think about this. This is a building that was built by the Delta Hospice Society, not by the British Columbia government. It wasn't built by them at all. It was built by the Delta Hospice Society. Uh, the government expropriated the building because obviously it wanted the hospice, okay? In Ontario, when uh, I asked for euthanasia, doctors are obligated to provide an effective referral for euthanasia. So this is where it's gone in my province of Ontario. So doctors who believe that killing their patients by uh, euthanasia is wrong, they're told that they must send their patients to a killer. You must do so if you're requested for euthanasia. Obviously, these uh, physicians don't want to do that because that is participation in the act, and they refuse to participate in the act. So as I say, effective referral means referral for the purpose of the act. Are you thinking this isn't going to happen in Australia? Well, why wouldn't it happen in Australia? Let's be honest. Let's, let's say uh, if this has become something that's offered, then obviously speaking, you have to then have physicians willing to refer in order for people to get the act, right? So there'll be pressure to force them to refer. Uh, Dr. Joel Zivit spoke to the recent Senate committee hearings on this whole issue, and he said, well, how is, he was explaining how people actually die by euthanasia and based on the drugs, he said it's not true that they're dying by their heart shutting down. What actually happens is their lungs shut down. So he was talking about how the drugs actually work, Dr. Joel Zivit. So he explained that, of course, what you do in euthanasia is you give the, it's a three drug system. One drug is to paralyze the body. Another drug is to put you to sleep. And a third drug actually shuts the lungs down, which causes the lungs to fill up with fluids. You actually die of drowning. And he was explaining scientifically how the drugs actually work. Now, that did not actually concern Canada's Senate committee. They thought that euthanasia for mental illness was a necessary thing still, and they wanted to expand euthanasia. But when you're actually talking about how the drugs actually work, you have to then analyze what do these drugs actually do to the body? How does euthanasia actually happen? Okay. So like the Netherlands and Belgium, Canada is now debating the expansion of euthanasia to children, to incompetent people who made an advanced request, to people who are incompetent with Alzheimer's and dementia, and we've already expanded it to people with mental illness, even though the government put a two-year uh, prohibition on that as they developed the protocols around killing. And this is all in five years. So think about this. So as I keep saying to people, there's really only one clear line. And that is either you allow killing or you don't allow killing. That's the clear line. Once you pass that line, the only acceptable solution then is the, the question is, what is it, when is it acceptable and who can do it? These are the only questions we're asking after that. So even if your member of parliament is promoting the bill says, oh, this is a very conservative law, you have to understand it can be amended in the very next parliament, right? Once you've legalized it, there'll be somebody complaining, oh, this wasn't fair to me because um, so-and-so with this medical condition, it couldn't apply to them because they're not capable of doing it. So therefore we have to change the law to expand it, right? This is how it goes. Euthanasia sold to the con culture as enabling personal autonomy. It's not about personal autonomy. It's about somebody else having the right and law to kill me. That's what it's about. We're told that assisted suicide is for people who are suffering and nearing death. It's not true. It's about people who are, are determined to have their life ended. Even if the law talks about terminal illness, how are you going to determine that? We are told that assisted suicide is a form of suicide because the per is not a form of suicide because the person rationally chooses death. And who's to determine that? All of these points are either phys uh, philosophically wrong or not usually the case. Um, I'm getting to the end here. I'm going to say to you very quick, clearly, why do people actually ask for euthanasia? Well, there's some radical autonomists out there. They want their right to die. They want to say, hey, it's my right to die. It's my body, my choice. So some people like that, but they're the minority. They're, they're the tiny group. 
most people die by euthanasia or ask for it because they're going through a difficult health condition. They're feeling depressed, lonely. They're experiencing feelings of hopelessness, and they believe their life has no purpose. This is what's going on. They are going through a difficult time of their life. They're going through a human reality of a difficult time, and they feel their life has lost purpose and meaning. Therefore, legalizing euthanasia is not about freedom, but rather it's about abandonment. It's about abandoning people. That's what it's actually about, okay? i give you some more information about our culture. Actually, I'm going to jump by this. I'm sure you have just as many lonely people in Australia as we have in Canada and the UK. So the culture of abandonment associated with suicide and assisted suicide can be changed. Uh, this is not a political issue now. This is about a caring issue. We need to build a caring culture. This is what we need. I'm going to jump through these slides. They're not important. But I'll tell you, euthanasia threatens my life. It threatens all of our lives. And why? Because we're human beings. It has nothing to do with anything else but it has to do with I am a human being. Human experience tells us that it's normal for a person, even myself, if I'm experiencing a serious illness or personal difficulties and loneliness, that I'll also fear for my future. I'll question my purpose for living. I'll experience existential distress, situational depression, losing hope. These are all normal human realities. Suffering alone, loneliness, isolation, depression, loss of hope, these are all primary reasons that lead to the euthanasia mentality and the idea that euthanasia is a good option. So basically, this is about a culture of abandonment. That's what this is about, okay? It's about abandoning people. So we are all affected by the legalization of euthanasia and assisted suicide. We have a serious problem with cultural loneliness. I'm going to jump past that because that's not what you're looking at. And there's my information. So what are my keys to fighting euthanasia? So I do have a video I did recently for Australia. I've got a few I could actually could send you that you can put up on your website. But the key is that we fight it by talking about what it actually is. We give the stories about what actually happens. Uh, Canada is a great example because of how fast we've moved. Uh, you may have moved slower in other Australian states, but it's inevitably going very fast. The fact of it is, is uh, when they're talking now in the Netherlands about euthanasia for people who are um, going through what they call, uh, they're tired of living. Now think about that. That's basically suicide on demand. But if you consider the concept, the concept actually makes sense once you've legalized euthanasia. The concept actually makes sense once you've legalized euthanasia. Anyway, we can have a discussion later about all this, and I think I've spoken long enough. Uh, thank you, Alex. That was an um, excellent presentation. It really put, put, put it in the picture. A quick question to you, Alex, and then Kevin, and then David, my colleague, will filter the questions that have come through. Alex, when the debate in Parliament in Canada was on, was there a religious view put or was it more a secular argument uh, from your perspective? A lot of faith groups here in New South Wales, Queensland, uh, looking at it from a faith perspective, but there's also a health secular type argument. Can you comment on that for me at all from your perspective? Okay, so there's a lot of people who will tell you don't actually bring up faith. And obviously with some people, if you bring up faith, they're just gonna reject you right off the bat because they're anti-faith, right? So we understand that that is a reality within the culture. But at the same time, um, it goes both ways because you know the fact is, is that people of faith are obviously gonna express themselves. I believe in not, uh, how would you say, hindering people, but I do believe in speaking to the culture from where they're at. So I always emphasize speaking to the culture from where they're at. So obviously speaking, I wouldn't be telling my supporters just to deny who they are, mm. but, the fact of it is, is in a secular culture, uh, a lot of people won't even listen to you unless you're actually giving an argument that affects them. Now, the problem with euthanasia, it's been changed. You know, originally it was seen as uh, an issue uh, that had um, a multi, how would you say, political sort of point of view. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is, is the political left have sort of really grabbed onto it. And so you have, sadly, some people who are blindly um, how would you say, blindly supporting it because they believe it fits with their political points of view, right? And this has become a serious problem. What I've always done in the past is I've tried to find people who have uh, uh, certain key points, like they might have uh, a concern about elder abuse. They might have a concern mm -hmm. about uh, other types of abuse. We might look at the whole issue of nursing home abuse that's going on within our culture or the lack of proper care. And they might and they might have a, an affinity for that argument. So when you're speaking to someone who uh, shows concerns around those areas, I would focus on that. I would focus very clearly on that. If you have a member of parliament who's uh, 
uh, a physician or a nurse, I would talk about, well, how does this affect their conscience rights? How is this going to affect other physicians doing their job in an already difficult medical climate? Thank you, Alec. And a quick one from Kevin, then over to you, David. Kevin, can you, from a parliamentary point of view, give us a feel as to what the mood is in, in New South Wales Parliament at the moment in terms of uh, the introduction of the bill by Alex Greenwich? Um, can you give us a feel for it all from your perspective, please, Kevin? Yeah, look, it's difficult, Greg. I, I think it's a little unknown where the chips are going to fall in this one. There are certainly a range of views and there's certainly not um, a cohesive, overwhelming mood to support this. I think it's going to be much more patchy. I think the argument is there to be made. We know we haven't been successful in other states, so it's not encouraging from that point of view. But by the same token, I think New South Wales is a little different. I think in our parliament, there are people who are much more likely to think deeply about the, the issues. And I, I know that Alex said, you know, you, you talk to the culture about where we are and lots of people will turn off when you talk religion. And yet, if religion doesn't have a place in issues of life and death, you'd, you'd wonder where. But these are fundamental life issues. And I think in New South Wales community broadly get that. Uh, and therefore, I think the parliamentarians are willing to listen to that. We certainly do have to take on board, as he said, though, talking directly to the issue about what this really is um, and not let our opponents frame the discussion with the, the way they want to picture it. I think we, we've got to steer it to actually confronting the reality. Thank you, Kevin. I'll come back to you with another question on conscience voting, but I'll leave that for the moment. I just want to get David Deliver now to field some of the questions from our people that have registered today. David, over to you, please. Oh, thank you, Greg. So a question for Kevin. What is the best strategy to beat the bill from your political perspective? Look, it's to persuade members of parliament that this is not in the public interest, that this is not a good thing. So it's got to, you've got to go to the heart of the issue. Um, I don't think it'll be one on opinion polls. And the reality about opinion polls on an issue like this is that they're superficial. Um, lots of people might think, oh yeah, I wouldn't want to be in that position because I don't want to suffer. So I support that. But we've got to have a deeper discussion about what this actually is and what it does to people involved in the process yep. and what it does to our broader culture if we accept this premise. We have to have that full-on discussion, and we have to get parliamentarians to listen seriously to those impacts of the reality of what we're doing. And I absolutely agree with Alex. This is the line. This is the red line. There is no other red line we can defend um, because this is the principle. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the other thing about what it is, like, I don't think we should hide from what it is because the fact of it is, is that uh, uh, if we want to uh, play the game a little bit and hold back a little bit, it's not going to help us. Now, I'll go one step further, though. Uh, a lot of people talk about palliative care as the answer. So we're going to focus on palliative care as the answer. Well, it doesn't necessarily help us in the same sense as you might be thinking, because the euthanasia lobby, those people also support palliative care. So they're going to argue right off the bat. They're going to say to you, oh, Kevin, I also support palliative care. I think that we need to have the best palliative care possible. But I also support this other choice, as they would say. So they're going to undermine that argument. But I'll go one step further, uh, because there was a question here about uh, I saw in the chat about what is the difference between you know, overdose and that. Remember, they're not using palliative care drugs in euthanasia. They're not using that at all. They're using a different type of drug completely. And they're using a three drug system. So when we're talking about the intentional overdose of somebody in palliative care, which is the abuse of those drugs, obviously, there is a big difference between killing somebody intentionally by painkilling drugs and actually caring for them. But this is not the same thing as euthanasia in the sense of once it's legalized, because as I'm saying to you, even though they're morally the same to kill, uh, what I'm saying is they're using a to totally different drug regimen, right? And uh, so it's not going to be the same question. Uh, to overdose someone is always wrong, absolutely. Uh, nonetheless, you see what I'm getting to. It's a different drug regimen. Yeah. David? Uh, question again for Kevin. Uh, one of the webinar participants says that the leader of the government in the in the lower house and the leader of the opposition in in the lower house are both against euthanasia is that correct and can that be used advantageously for us 
Look, it's certainly is an encouraging factor if both Chris Minns and Gladys Berejiklian will vote against this, uh, because naturally some members on either side will take notice of their leader's position. Uh, it's a much better starting point than, than not having that. Um, I don't know how this will pan out. I don't think anybody actually does uh, or could predict with certainty just how this is going to play out, whether it will go into debate, whether it'll, um, which house it will be introduced into first. I, I don't know the mechanics. Uh, it's in Alex Greenwich's court to decide which house to bring it into. And the rules of the parliament differ in each of the houses as to the process. But I do know that there's much more mixed feeling about this than there was about the abortion issue that we had two years ago, and there's not the rush. Uh, that, that issue was thrown at us with a, the speed of a, a truck rolling over the top of us, and there was no time for Parliament to do its job properly. I think that will be different this time, and therefore I think it'll be a much tighter outcome. Kevin, just a quick follow-up on that, because this is critical. Um, we make the point that the Premier made it clear that she would not have a conscience vote anymore. Now, you're suggesting that it may go to a debate because then she's retracting her promise that there will not be a conscience vote. Um, what are your views on that, please, Kevin? Well, there's two different elements to that. We can't control what an independent member of parliament does. He can introduce the bill and, it, you know, if he chooses to introduce it, it's there, it's on the table and the processes of the parliament have to deal with that. So whatever Gladys Berejiklian's position, that's still going to happen. What is then up for debate is how the government responds, whether we have a government position, whether it's a conscience vote position. And I do know what Gladys said. Um, I was in the party room when it yeah, got set. So correct. Uh, I absolutely know where that's coming from. Um, but I, yeah, I, I'm just being honest and saying, I can't really predict how this is going to play out in terms of process. Thank you. David? A question for Alex, uh, given your global perspective on these matters. The question is, how is social thinking changed as a result of legalising euthanasia? For example, does, does that drive up the suicide rate or how does it change people's thinking? Okay, so the euthanasia lobby will tell you that it doesn't affect the suicide rate, but they're actually lying to you. If you look at the data from the Netherlands or you look at the data from Oregon, the state of Oregon, which even has, uh, it's different because it's, it's just assisted suicide, but even there you can see that the suicide rate is higher and has gone up. Uh, the Netherlands is the prime example of that Canada is only in for five years so far, so it'd be hard to, uh, you know, gauge that. Uh, what I will say to you, though, is that the opposition that was going to focus on like the pro assisted suicide euthanasia people, they're going to be uh, focusing on Oregon. And the reason is, is, of course, the numbers are smaller there. And they're going to say, well, really, it doesn't, it's not going to add up to a lot of deaths and it's going to provide, you know, great relief for certain people, etc. Uh, but the fact of it is, is if they're legalizing euthanasia also, it's not the same as Oregon at all. When you legalize assisted suicide only, you have a much smaller number of deaths. And the reason for that is it's, it's just a human experience reality that it's far easier to get somebody or to have someone lethally inject me than it is for me to take the drugs myself, right? So assisted suicide, I have to take them myself. There is still a, a very much of a, that's not really even a, the taboo question, it's the question of the person's reluctance to take lethal drugs. There's just a reality of if the human person doesn't do that easily. Whereas euthanasia, someone's actually doing it to you, they're injecting you, it's homicide, it's easier to get someone to kill me than for me to kill myself is what I'm saying. So you see the numbers are so much higher everywhere that euthanasia is legal as compared to assisted suicide. So don't let the opposition say, oh, in Oregon, there's only so many deaths and da da da, -da. It's not about Oregon when we're talking about euthanasia, it's about Canada, it's about the Netherlands, it's about Belgium, that's who you're comparing to now. Uh, if you can't compare also, um, the number of deaths. So in my province of Ontario, we've had, uh, as I say, we've had this now for a little over five years, and there's only been two assisted suicide deaths in Ontario since legalization. There's been about 8,000 euthanasia deaths. Mm. Two assisted suicide deaths, 8,000 euthanasia. Now, I know it's not been the same in Victoria, Australia, but give it a year or two, and you're going to notice that the doctors are going to be reluctant to do assisted, su assisted suicide also, and that there's another reason why they're reluctant. These drugs are very ha harsh and horrible, and they burn, if you have to take it internally, it burns your throat. It's horrible to take these drugs, but to inject you is a different story. It's injected straight into you. Uh, it gets right into your bloodstream. It's a totally different story when they inject you than when you have to take it yourself. So the assisted suicide thing has a much higher failure rate 
and it's got also a higher problematic rate because how horrible these drugs are and, and how terrible they are. Now, why do they have to give you a three drug system? Well, the problem with the euthanasia drugs is to cause you to go into convulsions. So if you read the early Dutch studies, this from uh, you know 15 years ago, you'll see that they had this big problem with people going into convulsions and people throwing up and people going through these hideous, hideous uh, reactions. So that's why they paralyze you. The one drug is to paralyze you. Why is that? Because then you don't go into convulsions. Why do they sedate you? They sedate you because then uh, it's not uh, then a horrible thing to give you these horrible, caustic, terrible drugs. These are drugs that are horrific. Uh, and, and yet they do it that way because uh, your reaction otherwise would be people would go, like, could you imagine seeing a loved one going into uh, convulsions? Mm -hmm. You'd say, well, that's horrific. How could you legalize that? So obviously they paralyze you. They give you a, a, para a drug to paralyze you, a drug to put you to sleep, and then a drug which shuts down your lungs, and your lungs then fill up with fluids, and you die actually of asphyxiation. That's actually how you die. But people don't think of it that way because we're told, no, it shuts down your heart. Well, that's actually a lie. And uh, Dr. Joel Zivit explained it. He says, no, no, these drugs don't affect your heart. They actually affect your lungs. He said, look at what, you know, just look at the science of it. But people didn't care, right? He said, oh, they, they, the people don't notice it. So you can't hear them screaming because obviously you've sedated them and you've paralyzed them. So obviously speaking, you're not going to know how they're going to react to it. But with assisted suicide, we know there's some pretty horrific deaths in Oregon. And you can read some of my data. If you go to my articles on these lethal drugs and how they react and with assisted suicide, there are some pretty horrific deaths. That's pretty bad. Mm. Even so with following drugs. Following that up, Alex, is it not the case that people are dying in terrible pain? How effective is palliative care? Okay, so palliative care is very effective, but let's not kid around. The, the human reality is there are some conditions that you have, especially let's say, let's say you've had a terrible cancer and you've been doing everything you can to fight that cancer. And what happens is the body really starts wearing down from the treatment. Hey, you're going through this treatment, you're fighting that cancer, you're doing everything you can to survive. And then at a certain point, they say, there's nothing more we can do for you. Uh, at that point, there are times when the, the, um, the treatment was so harsh in your body that you start getting the breakdown of your cartilage and things like that. So you have a bone against bone problem. So you get in this neuropathic type pain. Now that can be mitigated by drugs, but really the only real way to deal with neuropathic pain is through sedation. And there's nothing morally wrong with sedation. But the fact of it is, is there are some cases like that. And I'm not saying, oh, everybody goes to that. In fact, when you look at the data, very few people are actually asking for euthanasia or assisted suicide because of uncontrolled pain. Uh, fear of uncontrolled pain, fear of future pain, yes, that's quite significant. But the actual uncontrolled pain is actually a very minor uh, number. Uh, but the fact of it is, is yes, uh, we know with palliative care, it's excellent. It can do amazing things. But let's be brutally honest. There are some cases that are pretty terrible. Uh, and uh, the only real way to deal with those cases ethically is sedation because uh, it's pretty horrific, right? Uh, and that's usually, and, I'm, and I'm, I think I'm describing it accurately. They've gone through a lot of cancer treatment by that point and the body is breaking down. So uh, they're nearing death and, and it's pretty bad, yeah. Yeah. Uh, another question, uh, Alex. Uh, what percentage of doctors want to be involved in euthanasia? And is there pressure coming upon doctors in jurisdictions that have legalized euthanasia pressure upon them to change their mind, to act against their conscience for professional reasons? And the answer to all that is uh, originally um, when we looked at polling in Canada, most doctors wanted nothing to do with it, but there were enough who were willing to participate that getting the whole thing, getting the whole regime started was not a difficulty. But then of course, in, in Canada, they specifically also allowed nurse practitioners to be involved in it because they wanted to increase the number of people who could be directly involved in it. So you don't only have doctors and you, if you add nurse practitioners in, that's a whole huge other group of people who are now capable of being involved in it. So you increased your numbers. Uh, but the fact is, is there's a ton of pressure. There's huge pressure on physicians who don't participate to participate, whether they're forcing referral or they're actually forcing participation. It's a huge number. And, um, and, it, and it's very difficult, like uh, similar to in, in Australia, where you have a group that are like Christian Medical Dental Society or groups like that. Mm. Uh, they are staunchly opposed to killing and they're not going to participate, et cetera. But they're going to find incredible pressure upon them to participate. Uh, they're being forced out. In Ontario, they're being now told, oh, if you want to become a physician in Ontario, 
well, maybe you should be a foot doctor, you know, a chiropodist or something, or maybe you should deal with uh, sports medicine or something, because they're saying, well, we don't want you involved in any of these moral questions because people have a right to that. And this is the kind of thing you're getting. So it starts also affecting people from that very beginning point when they're actually applying for medical school. They're being told, well, we really, um, we really don't want you because you're not willing to do certain things. And they ask specific questions. And I'll go one step further. There's a, a group of physicians that I know very well who are opposed to euthanasia and who, who share our values very strongly. And they've been heavily involved now with, how would you say, helping uh, people who are entering medical school. Uh, so they advise them, they um, mentor them through the process because they know unless someone's helping you, it's gonna be impossible for you to get through the process the way things are right now. Thank you, Alex. A quick one to Kevin and you, Alex, but Kevin first. You said you've, re you've read the bill in detail, so have I. I don't recall if there are any provisions for breach of euthanasia procedures. Um, Kevin, I think that's important. So, and I'll get you to comment on that in a minute. But Alex, first, have there been any prosecutions for breaches of euthanasia procedures in Canada? Uh, it's impossible because the law is designed to make it impossible. So, you know, in the bill, if you actually read the legislation of the law, you see that, you know, there are penalties for breaching the law. But how does the law actually operate? And I'm assuming your bill in your state is identical because every jurisdiction has been the same. Uh, the whole reporting procedure, the whole control procedures by the doctors. So, for instance, a doctor who approves the death and then a second doctor who agrees that, yeah, what you did, because it takes two, mm. could be a nurse practitioner also. Yep. They are self-reporting. It's a self-reporting system. Self so it doesn't matter if it's the Netherlands, Ontario, Oregon, Washington State, or Belgium. They all use a self-reporting system. So it's impossible to come up with um, uh, the facts which would actually be capable of prosecuting somebody. It's impossible. Yep. It can't be done. Yep. Kevin, can you comment on that? Look, it... it Alex is quite close to the money and this bill obviously is on a template kind of format uh, because there is that kind of reporting process. Yep. But I did notice when I went to the section on enforcement, I thought, oh, good, at least there are some rules. Mm. Um, the only person who could commence a prosecution is the health secretary mm. or somebody authorised by the health secretary, not the DPP. You can't go to the police and report a crime and have the police go to the DPP for prosecution that pathway is not open, mm. um, which you would normally do for any other crime. It has to be by the Secretary for Health. And as Alex has pointed out, who's got the data? It's all within the health system. So right. unless there's somebody strongly motivated within the health system to do something about it, then um, any number of things could go straight through to the keeper. Yeah. So there was a case in Washington State a few years ago that Margaret Dorr took, and it was a family member who was convinced that uh, his dad didn't want to die. And it was actually, you know, after his dad got drunk, he had the lethal drug. So he had requested them. He had them, the whole thing. And this is assisted suicide, not euthanasia. So he had the lethal drugs, but he was drunk uh, when he died. And so uh, the one family member was absolutely convinced that his dad didn't want to die because he had just spoken to his dad the day before. And so, uh, you know, Margaret, then they hired a, and they went to the police, they hired an investigator, they went to the police, they did everything. And the state said, well, this is all privacy. You have no right to this information. So there was no way to even get the actual report and to try and some way find something in the report. There was no way. So therefore, under privacy laws, it made it impossible anyway. Uh, here in Canada, there was the case of Alan Nichols in, in Chilliwack, B.C., who was only depressed. That's all he was. He wasn't physically ill. He wasn't dying. He was depressed. His family was absolutely insanely upset with the fact that he died by euthanasia. They went to the police. They, they begged them to launch an investigation. And the police said, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do. There's no way. There's no, you know, and they, they, uh, they also had the right to the information because they were the power of attorney. So they went to try and seek the information through the Fraser Health Authority. Fraser Health is who overlooks health in, uh, under the BC Act in that region. And the Fraser Health Authority has not released the information. They said it's under privacy, even though this, these family members are the power of attorney and then legally have the right to the medical information. It's never been released. So it's all a cover up. Uh, so, you know, try and find some way to prosecute. It's impossible. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. Now, the Netherlands is a little different, but it wasn't different because it's this the reporting system is different. It's different because in some of these cases, these doctors are so 
you know, convinced that everything's fine. So for instance, that uh, the coffee euthanasia case in the Netherlands, the doctor who, mm-hmm. who had sedated the person and, and because the, the woman who had dementia was resisting, she didn't want to die by euthanasia. She was saying, no, no, no. So they put uh, the, uh, the sedation in her coffee and then uh, she continued to resist. So she had the family hold her down. She actually self-reported that. So that shows actually up in the report. So how many times that's happened where the doctor, of course, wasn't, how would you say, cavalier enough to self-report? Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, we don't know. But what we do know is in that case, the physician actually self-reported that, which is very interesting because very few people self-report abuse of the law mm. or at least questionable acts. Yeah. David. A question for Kevin. You've mentioned that the alleged safeguards in the bill are like lipstick. Are there any safeguards that would be acceptable or workable? Look, the, the particular things I was thinking of, um, I went to see what would happen to a faith-based aged care home or hospital. And it does give the right to those organisations not to participate. But then in the next breath, it says, but they must allow somebody to come into their premises to talk to their residents to provide these services uh, and to facilitate transfer to another place where something is going to be done. So there's no sense of a person being safe, even in a faith-based aged care home where they think yeah. euthanasia isn't going to happen. If somebody in that place asks for it to occur, then representatives from some lobby group who do favour euthanasia are able to come in, able to talk to residents about it, able to promote their wares effectively. Yeah. So um, if your law is anything similar to... So if your law is anything similar to Canada, the only actual safeguard that has any meaning is the 18-year-old... Uh, it, you have to be 18 to have it. But if you look at that, that is discrimination. So even that's going to get struck down. Because obviously speaking, if there's a 17-year-old or 16-year-old who has the same condition as someone who might be 18 or 19, and they would qualify if they were just happened to be 18, how could you deny it to them? Like that would seem, I know your courts are a little different in Australia than Canada, but you can see how that's clear discrimination. So they throw that in there to say to you, oh, it's only adults. It's only people of sound mind. Well, what if you were of sound mind when you requested it and then you had a stroke? So now when they actually come to inject you, you're not of sound mind. So now are they going to deny it to you? Oh, well, we better change that law because now you're denying them their right to die. Like it, gets a, it gets to be a mess because of the I'm fact that... i you raised that um, issue of sound mind, Alex, because that's not even in this bill. There is no provision, no requirement right. for a person to be assessed psychologically. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's actually a presumption in favour of the ability to give uh, give consent in favour of that capacity. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. in fact, it's, the only person it's not real consent is what you're saying. Somebody who can be shown not to have it. Correct. Alex, just, uh, I'm sorry to go back to this, but I spoke about faith before. Look, a lot of us as Christians have a different approach, a biblical approach to suffering and death. Now, as a Christian, I need to be able to express that to my legislators, to government, but you said not to use that argument. What I'm trying to get at is that how do we as Christians use our faith to make legislators understand that we're opposed to this form of legislation, you know, of euthanasia, of VAD? Because quite frankly, Alex, you know, we have to argue from a faith point of view, from a belief point of view, um, not only from a mere medical point of view. Uh, do you have a comment on that at all? Mm. I, I'm not going to say anything about because the fact of it is, is uh, you know, your organization is a faith based group, essentially. And so yeah. the fact of it is, is if you're representing yourself, they know who you are. So yep. it doesn't there's no reason why you wouldn't represent a faith point of view. Okay. But what if you're just an average citizen? And I would say that we should stick to what it is and be very simple and straightforward. Let's not get into all these issues. Yeah. Once we start bringing in yeah. all these other issues, suddenly now it becomes about are you a religious or are you not religious? Yeah. Are you yeah. in favor of abortion or not in favor of abortion? Because it all just talk about I'm opposed to killing people. Yeah. I, I, this, yeah. What what is this? Let's mm. talk about what this is. Yeah. And, and now, mm. um, and let's just be very clear about what it is and, and not go further than that. We don't have to go into all these different things. Okay. Uh, that doesn't mean that your organization should uh, hide who you are. Obviously, they know who you are. And you should speak up. And I'm assuming the same thing for the church groups. They, uh, mm. whether it be a Catholic church, a, pre- a Pentecostal, whoever it might be, they the legislators know who they are. So if they're going to come out and and talk secularly, they say, 
you know, whatever. We know who Pastor so and so is. Who's kidding who here? So yeah, that's the, the point. Po the point is, Alex, that a lot of hospitals are religious based. And that's they're going right. to oppose this. So that's the issue that I'm trying to allude to. Yeah, I know. And no. you're going to have to mm. uh, not only defend their rights, mm. but at the same time, I, as I say, stick to what this is. Uh, I think our arguments have to be very clean and clear. And it, we're not um, hiding our, our faith. And what we're doing is we're just saying, what does this bill do? And this is why I'm opposed. I'm opposed mm. to it because I'm opposed to killing. That's the first thing. I don't have to go much further than that, really. Mm. But of course, then, of course, they're going to say, you're going to also force my healthcare providers to kill. Now, well, how does this affect me? Well, I think there's a fundamental question about what it means to be human. And I recognize that as a human being, I might also go through my dark time of the soul. I recognize that. I, I'm no different. I'm not, I'm not any different than anybody else. I might become so darkened by my situation that I'm blind. I've got blinders on and I can't see beyond that. So, how do you protect me even? How do you do that? Well, the only way to do that is to have a physician who has the right, the conscience right, to say no to killing me. So if I have a physician who knows who yeah. I am and has, yeah. says no to killing me, then at least I know I have some yeah. protection in the culture. But if my physician has no rights mm. either, that they're going to have to refer me because I've asked for it, then I'm as good as dead. Thank you. So yeah. Thank you, Alec. David, one, one last question, please. Yes, uh, last question. Can you comment, please, on Alex, on the difference between a doctor giving a sufficient pain relief, which has the unintended effect of killing the patient on the one hand, and then deliberately choosing to cause the death of the patient on the other? Yeah, they're different issues in the fact that uh, if a, a physician's going to, so once again, now we're talking about pain relief, we're talking about analgesics, which is not what they're using to kill people by euthanasia. Nonetheless, uh, every day, whether we like it or not, uh, there are people being killed by intentional overdoses. And I think that's a very serious thing, and that should never be happening. Now, the other side is going to argue, yes, we know that also happens. So if we legalize this, we can regulate well, if you look at the Netherlands and Belgium, now we haven't done any studies in Canada, so I can't say, but if you look at the Netherlands and Belgium, the data around the intentional overdose of people using pain-killing drugs shows that, in fact, legalizing euthanasia didn't lessen those numbers at all. It actually increased those numbers. So someone who never asked to die, and they'd be, you know, the physician's thinking, well, you know, normally speaking, I'd euthanize this, this, this condition because that's that seems to be the right thing to do but this person has never asked for it so we're going to give them an intentional overdose to just not tell anybody you may think why would someone do that well if it's okay to kill why wouldn't it be okay to kill this person who's suffering you think it's the right thing to do it's the same problem with when we get to the dementia they'll say oh so and so this is what we're debating now in canada so and so asked for this already in their power of attorney they said if i had dementia I would want euthanasia. So now they're taking, they're saying, should we take that then as a request for euthanasia once they're incapable of consenting? And the government's talking about accepting that. Well, think this one through. If mm. that's acceptable, then why wouldn't I kill somebody with dementia when you look at them and they're suffering so greatly? Well, actually, the reality is who's suffering is me watching them. That's who's suffering more, you know, in, in a greater sense. But nonetheless, why wouldn't you? And, and of course, that's what the end becomes the, re, the result of because people are doing this already. Anyway, there's a big difference between intentional overdose and lethal drugs that are intentional for euthanasia. But remember, uh, they shouldn't be using intentional overdose. They shouldn't be doing that. We should be controlling analgesics to the point. If you, entite, if you uh, increase the amount of drug on a regular basis, but in a controlled way, there's no reason why you're going to kill someone. You can kill their pain without killing the patient. Well, I was just no, going to jump surreal. in there, yep. if I could, Jay, uh, David, to say there is a philosophical difference between giving pain relief to relieve pain, which may also have the effect of hastening death, but is not intended to do so, mm -hmm. right? and intentionally giving drugs to cause death. Um, right. And in, in, oh, yeah. in, I in agree with you completely. Yeah. that can be a reality where the intention is not to cause death, but it may have that unintended effect as a consequence of relieving pain. And that's certainly a different philosophical proposition altogether. Right. But we have to be brutally honest. A, a palliative care physician is well-trained. Well, probably almost never, ever uh, accidentally overdose somebody because they know how to do the proper... Now, there might be the odd case where it did happen, but that person was probably pretty soon to die anyway. Like, they never meant to kill them. I mean, they never meant to overdose them. 
Uh, but this is such a rare occurrence that that would happen for a properly trained physician. Uh, so what we're talking about usually in that case is intentional overdose. That's why I brought that up. Uh, but obviously I agree with Kevin. There's a clear philosophical difference between no intention to kill, but the patient died. It's the same thing with surgery though. Uh, when someone's on the surgeon's table and they die on the surgeon's table, did the surgeon intend to kill them? No. Did it happen? Yes. Uh, do these things happen? Yes. Sadly, yeah, they do. It's the same idea. No one intended it. Thank you. Um, look, we're going to have to leave it there, gentlemen. Um, this this uh, webinar is being recorded. It'll be made available in a couple of days' time. Um, thank you very much, Alex. Thank you, Kevin. But I wonder if you could just stay with us and David will close in prayer. So I hope that's okay with everybody. And then uh, I'll bid everybody farewell. Thank you, David. Father, we do thank you for this uh, very informative webinar, very disturbing information that's been shared. And we do ask that we will take up the baton, that we will go into battle in relation to the equipping that we've had today. And I do pray for Kevin and for his colleagues in the parliament, especially that your wisdom will be upon them. And I pray for Alex, that you will continue to use him as an international advocate for the defense of life. And so we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. And I pray that you will energize all who have participated and others who will be watching the recording as it's made available and that there'll be a, a strong defense of life in the New South Wales Parliament. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, David. Um, thank you, Kevin. Uh, we will be in touch. Alex, thank you very much for those words of wisdom and insight into how we handle our upcoming legislation in New South Wales and Queensland. Uh, may I thank you on behalf of the Governing Board of Family Voice Australia, uh, our members, our supporters, and of course, all those people that have joined. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming on board. Uh, we wish you farewell, and this will be available on the Family Voice YouTube in about three or four days' time. So thank you very much, and good evening to you, Alex, and good morning to everybody else. Thank you. Thank you.